Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta. Back to you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. Hello, and thank you for watching IT Pro TV, helping you learn everywhere you go. I'm your host, Zach Memis, for this episode of CEHV10, and this episode is Hidden Files. So we've asked our expert, Daniel Lowry, to explain. Explain! Explain! <laughs> yes! We will try our best to explain this to you today. And it, it will be about Hidden Files. We do thank uh, Zach for having me. Thank you for joining us, as always. We love our viewers out there, so keep on watching, especially mm. if you're trying to pass that CEH. We're going to do our best to get you up to speed and ready for that. But like my man Zach has said, it is about Hidden Files today. That's what we need to go over. And so this is my number one question to you, is as a certified ethical hacker, why would we want to hide files? Why are we doing it? Because it's fun. Yeah, <laughs> that's why. Uh, not only that is it fun, it can be also be quite frustrating uh, when you find out some weird nuances in the way the yes. things that you need to work uh, do actually work in the real life world in which we do live. So we'll, I'll make sure to cover that because, hey, a learning experience for me, for, for me means more information for you because yes. I will pass that along to my good viewers out there. Uh, but reasons we would want to do this, stealth is the mm -hmm. number one, right? right. You just want to be stealthy, could be engaged in pure red teaming activities, which means that you want to go uh, unnoticed for as long as humanly possible. Or you could be on the opposite end of the spectrum where you're attempting to uh, test and see how well security controls uh, that are implemented by the blue team are actually effective. You want to see how, you, how long you can go undetected. You want to see what level of detection do they they do find what was it that raised their ire, their their eyebrow, and said, hmm, I need to look further into something here before they were uh, on to you, kind of as it were. What was the indication of compromise, the IOC? So that'd be two really good reasons for why we would want to try to be as stealthy as possible when we're in engagement. Mm -hmm. And executing programs and so forth. Well, well, how, yeah. how, how can we do this? Yeah, great question. How, I, mean, how, I mean, the mechanics of it, how can we actually hide them? Yeah, that's 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 the question of the day, actually. And as Zach kind of alluded to, you know, executing programs, we can be able to do that. Just hide gathered data so that it's not laying around because that is going to raise an eyebrow. If you've got a folder called, oddly enough, this is a true story, hacky hack hack, hacky. <laughs> someone might go, I wonder what's in there. <laughs> and, and Zach's laughing. This is an actual true story of some. I think he was a 14 or 15 year old no, kid. No, I, I think I've read this. He hacked into Apple, and when they uh, found his folder, it was called Hacky, Hacky Hack Hack, Hack, and it had all this, the data he had gathered mm -hmm. inside of it. And there you go. All right, so don't don't name your folders Hacky Hack Hack. <laughs> no, not a good idea. That would probably so it's just simple obfuscation like that. Name it something that makes it look like it's a part of the system. That's one way in which we could hide files, just using simple guile and deception. But we're going to go a little more high-tech than that. Oh, good. Yeah, we're going to use the uh, ADS system, which is the uh, alternate data streams, which is found as a part of NTFS file systems. Now, here's the fun part about this. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, yeah. This is Zach knew this was coming. <laughs> You're not able to use this, at least not that I'm aware of. I've tried, and it failed horribly, uh, <laughs> to work inside of PowerShell. So this is inside of a command line uh, utility. You have to be at the command prompt for this to work, not PowerShell, command prompt, mm -hmm. right? That's that's what you're looking for. Um, because you get odd re returns uh, on your investment when it comes to trying to work with this in PowerShell. It doesn't tell you, hey, I don't support that. It just goes, weird things you're doing. Uh, and you're like, oh, well, that file doesn't seem right. Oh, well, that file seems right, what's going on here? So don't try to do that no. there. It doesn't seem to work very well. The command prompt is what is gonna give you the action you're looking for. So let's talk a little more about ADS. Yeah. What does this do? Basically, you're putting two files together, and this is why they call them streams. You're streaming one file from another, right? Now, cool attributes about the ADS. I will give it its kudos. I will say, you know, props to you, ADS. When you look at the files, you do a DIR, which is why I typically stay in PowerShell because it allows me to do an LS. I'm a Linux user. People, come on, help me out here. <laughs> right? uh, I, I, can't, I can't break that, that habit of doing LSs, so I try to stick in PowerShell. But when you're in a command line, do a DIR, list your files out, and also tells you the file size. Right? Great. When I've streamed one file into another, I can then delete the original file, 
and the copy of it exists as the ADS stream, okay? But it doesn't show up when I do a DIR. It just shows the first file, the, the file that's being streamed to, and its attributes, size, name, and, you know, uh, permissions, attributes, right? So that's the, that's the stealthy mode thing of it, right? So it's hiding inside of those files. Let's jump into the computer. Let's see what we're talking about here. Kind of explain this a little better for you here. I'm going to do a DIR. Here we have some files, okay? So uh, I've been testing this. This is how I learned that all this stuff isn't working in PowerShell like I would like. But if we scroll in a little bit, we can see what's going on here. You'll notice I've got this file, uh, plain.txt, and of course I can't mark on it, which is another reason I like PowerShell over the command line. But hey, whatever you're going to do, you can see where my cursor is. And it says that it's 17 bytes. Uh, it's plain.txt. Looks awesome, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing to it. If I do type uh, plain.txt, you'll see it just says this is some text. So there you go. Standard file. I can open Notepad. Pad, or maybe I can open Notepad for plain.txt, and I can edit this file. So coming here, this is some more text, right? Do the old save Rooney. Save that and file exit. And now I could run that type command again and we see this is some text, do another DIR, and we're getting, you know, increased file size, which is just exactly what we're expecting. But, but, but. wait, there's more. Actually, you see this file right here, malware.exe. Mm -hmm. Full disclosure, it's just netcat that I renamed to malware.exe. You'll notice it has a substantially larger file size. I left it there so we can see all this fun stuff. It actually exists inside. It's streamed to this plane.txt file. Interesting, right? A lot mm -hmm. of fun. Yeah. So it's hiding there. It's, it's there. It's available. I can actually uh, call it forth if I need to, but you don't see it. And that's the whole purpose, right? That's that stealthiness that we were looking for. So how do we do this? How do we create this file inside of a file without any kind of detection? It's really simple when you use the command line and not PowerShell. Uh -huh. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. I'll show you how to do this. It'll be a lot of fun. So let's uh, first we need to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that exe. I'm going to put it into just another text file so you can see how this works. So I'm going to do type. I'll say malware dot or not txt exe for this one because that's the name of the file. So I'm starting off with the file that I want to stream into, and then I do a greater than into what file do I want to go with? So I'll call it, how about plain2.txt, colon malware.exe. There we go. So this should stream the one file into the other. Hit return, no errors, which is what I always enjoy. And now that file is in there, all right? It is, it is actually being hidden by the ADS system, okay? So now what we need to do is we need to make a link to that file so that we can call it because this is an exe. I'll eventually want to execute that file. Now, if it was just another text file, um, that's not too, not too big of a deal. I can show you that really quickly here. Let's, let's do that. Let's make another one. Um, I'll say type. I'll just take plain.txt, and I will put that into plain3.txt. Oh, yeah, plain3. TXT. There we go. And plain.txt. There we go. And now I can do like notepad. If I wanted to bring up the information that's in that hidden stream, I can do notepad plain3.txt colon plain.txt. And if we look up, there's the text to the hidden file. Mm -hmm. Right? And you can see that as well because if we close this and we exit out, and if I just fire off Notepad without that, and just give me plain three, you notice there's no text, oh. right? So there we go. They're hiding together. Mm -hmm. But I've got an executable, so I can I can run an executable. I just need to make a link to do so. Let's see here. I'll show you how to do that. And let's see here. We just do an M K L I N K, make link, and just create a link name that you want to call it. So maybe. I'll call it, um, I don't know, I, I called this one secret.exe, right? Super, super fun. Uh, I'll call it top secret. 
exe correct. Does that spell correctly? Yeah, the exe, xe, there we go. And uh, just give it the path of the file. So this one is here. So I just need, what did I name that? Complain 2txt xt colon malware dot exe. Like so. And symbolic link has been created. And now when I call that symbolic links executable, which is top secret secret uh, exe, you'll notice it drops me down to a prompt. And I can uh, start a listener over on my Kelly box. And see. There we go. Do that really quickly. And now get zoomed back in. Now I can just fire off. Like so, with normal connectivity, that's 202 on 4444-e slash cmd.exe. And you'll notice I now have a command prompt from over there. So I was able to hide that executable file using the ADS streams, okay? So that's, um, that's basically the gist of it when it comes to creating ADS, it's not really that difficult. It's just a lot of moving parts to it that you need to, I like, that's why I like cheat sheets, create a cheat sheet. Cheat sheets are nice. And then you're off to the races, right? We like that. So now I can hide malicious things like malware or whatever using ADS and then call it when I need it. But, but. Are, are these hidden files detectable at all? Yeah, they are detectable. And I think if I'm not mistaken, let me do a DIR here. You'll notice that these are showing, these sim links are showing up as where they're at. See, that's kind of like, kind of popping up right there. So plane two is hiding malware.exe. Uh, Secret.exe is hiding plane.txt with malware.exe. So just doing a DIR could show these, right? But you'll notice over here with plane three, it's not showing it. Right? It doesn't show you that there is another text file, which was plain.txt, hidden in the alternate data stream. So if you want to find them all, make sure that you're getting a, uh, there's a couple of tools. LADS is one of them. Uh, you can go and download that. It's a third-party application. You can also use Streams, which is a part of sysinternals. Mm. So if you have sysinternals installed, that's always a good idea to have. Uh, use that to, to look for them. There are GUI tools like Stream Armor or the Forensics Toolkits. Great stuff. I endorse both of those things. They're uh, wonderful tools. Mm -hmm. But let's, um, let me exit out of here and jump back over. And I can actually, because I have uh, sysinternals installed. So let's take a look at that. CLS this thing. And I just want to make sure you guys can see everything really well. And I'll just do a streams, not streams, streams dash S, and then tell it where to look, which is right here. And you'll notice it is finding those files. So file two has malware.exe, right? Uh, malware.exe, there's plane one, plane two, and plane three. It was finding all of them. Now it didn't find the sim links, but because the sim links te technically don't have the data stream, it's these files that do. So if you were getting confused on that, hopefully that helps clarify that. But streams is a great uh, method for finding these things. So. Make sure you have sysinternals installed so you can look for them. What about FTK? Yeah, FTK is the Forensics Toolkit. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it will also be able to data carve and look for these types of things. Uh, so if you have that installed, which you totally should, yes, you should. it will uh, find them uh, as it looks through the device looking for forensic activity. So any of these techniques similar to steganography? Yeah, uh, this doing data streams is superficially a type of stego. So uh, I, I always like to say it's the gateway into true steganography, yeah. which is hiding files inside of files. But usually this is hiding files inside of um, like audio, visual, so pictures, uh, videos, oh. or audio files. Okay. So we can do that. We can play around with that. It's, uh, it's actually kind of a lot of fun to do because you get to, I mean, it makes me feel like I'm in like high school again and you're passing secret stuff that the teacher can't read, you know, because it's all hidden. She, it's right in front of her, mm -hmm. but she can't see it because of our methods that we're using to keep it on the down low, right?
So um, let's talk about uh, Stego a little bit. I do have the ability to do Steg Hide. Let's go in here, clear this out. I've got this installed on my Kali box. What I can do is, let's see here. I think, I know I've got some pictures somewhere. LS, probably in my documents. That's where I typically hide these things. Not one there though. Where was I hiding this? Let me look in the file directory. It's a little easier to bounce around for this kind of stuff in there. There's a pictures folder. Yeah, we do have some pictures there. Looks good. Let's use one of those. So where is pictures hiding? Ah, oh, there it is, pictures. Oh, so, all right, we got a couple of uh, pictures here. Here's one, uh, this is a 007 picture. That, that ought to work for us. Good. Excellent, so let's do this. Oh, we do Steg Hide is the tool mm -hmm. installed on Kali by, I think, I think it was by default. I don't think I installed this. I think it's there. So we just say embed, like so, dash CF, tell it what picture, with this is 4007.jpg, and then dash EF to secrets.txt, like so. Now it's asking us to enter our passphrase, so it's controlled. So even if someone in some way, shape, or form does detect whether or not or thinks there is, they would still need to know the passphrase to exfiltrate the data. So I'll put up just password one. Oh, I can't type RD1. Could not open the file secret.txt. That's fine. Maybe it's because I typed my password horribly wrong a million times. Or I might need, yeah, let's, let's make a credits.txt. And now, run that one more time. There we go. So you just have to make sure it won't, it will obviously, it won't, obvi it won't automatically create the file that you um, specify. You have to have it already created. So there you go. A little, little odds and ends about these things. Got to pick up along the way. But there we go. We have now embedded inside of secret. If I do an ls l, there is secret. And you'll notice it knows it has zero size. If I cat the file, secrets.txt, nothing inside. And I can work with it as just like any other normal file and play around with it. It's, it's a great time. But mm -hmm. that picture is hidden inside of that file. Or actually, uh, yeah. I think that's the way we did it. I think we did the picture in the file. You could do it the other way where you put the file in the picture, mm -hmm. which is probably, uh, uh, but depending on what you're doing, you can go. But that's how you uh, embed things using Steghide. You can also do, uh, if you want to check for it, so ways in which you can try, try to discover if you have Steghide installed, Steghide. And I think you just do dash dash info on secret.txt. Premature end of file. All right, that's weird. Maybe let's do the four. Oh, here we go. Yes. Oh, I didn't type in my passphrase. Let's try it again. Uh, yes. That's fun. One more time for the win. <laughs> I don't know why. Ah, there we go. You have to actually type Y. It doesn't do a default. Fun. Password one. There we go. And now it's seeing, here's the embedded file right there, secret.txt. Okay? Mm. Yeah, a lot of moving parts with these things typically. So find something you like to use for your steganography and stick with it. That way you'll be very familiar with the options. But as someone that might be doing forensics, you probably have to be pretty good with most steganographic uh, type of tools out there. But I want to pull the data out of this thing though. Let me see here, I can do, I'll remove secret.txt, and now I, you'll notice it's gone, it doesn't exist anymore, but if I wanna remove it, I can do steg, steg, hide, extract, and dash sf, and then whatever it is, so this is, there we go, enter the passphrase, and now you'll see it is back, I've successfully extracted the data out of my picture, so whatever, secrets from this company that I've been 
uh, slurking around in for the last two days <laughs> have exfiltrated successfully, and I'm good to go. But uh, like I said, you can hide all sorts of fun stuff inside of these things. And Steg Hide's not the only tool in town. Um, Open Stego is a GUI version uh, of a steganography tool. And you can hide audio, video, white space folders, or you can hide it in audio, video, white space folders, mobile, email, all sorts of great stuff. Are there techniques for detecting those files as well? Yes. Yes, there are. This is called steganalysis which is obviously different from steganography. This is the identifying mm -hmm. and, and discovering of steganographic files, okay? So with this, you'll probably want to use a tool. You could use this manually. You could just go through the files using, because you, you might have a bunch of different types of steganographic tools at your ready. And maybe you know what type of tool was used to hide the file. If you do, that's great. Any kind of known factor that you have will help you discern, maybe uh, get through. But there's also artifacts will show up inside of pictures that have steganographic files embedded in them. Uh, you'll hear odd sounds or distortions inside of audio or video, mm -hmm. right? So that might be a clue to the fact that, hmm, I wonder if that file is doing that. So always be, don't ever think a click or a pop or a whistle or a bump or whatever, a shimmy in an audio or video file is just that. It might be the indication that there's a hidden file there as well. And there are tools to extract this information to find out whether or not there are. Again, this is steg analysis. Uh, I do have one that I found I thought was really cool called Gargoyle Investigator. I had to go with this one because, <laughs> right? It's Gargoyle. Indeed. It's super awesome. You can check out their data sheet, but... It's an advanced malware discovery solution for computer forensics investigators. I'm hooked. Go ahead and shut up and take my money, right? Uh, I, I do believe this is a pay-for service, but you get neat GUIs that will look through and try to find. So you can in implement uh, case numbers and case names, who is the investigator, um, evidence numbers, so this is evidence, and you can run factory data sets against this, anti-forensics, botnets, so on and so forth. It's a great tool. It does more than just steganography or steganalysis. Um, so definitely check it out. If you are starting to work in forensics in any way, shape, or form, it's probably a good idea to invest into a tool much like this. But anything you can feed it to help it out, to figure it out whether or not there is something in there. So this could be the algorithm. This could be the cover media that's being used. I know that this media was used because then I can compare and see, or I, I suspect that this 007 picture has been used as cover media, and now I can check it against a copy of it that I have. So I need a, I need a pristine copy versus, versus the suspected uh, hiding copy, right? And then you can compare the two. Let's see here. What else can you have? Um, if you know the algorithm that was used, that could be helpful because then you can check using tools usually. Uh, and I say usually, I mean almost every, <laughs> invariably. Um, yeah, to do that. Different tells with different media, like I said, the audio and video might have pops and whistles and clicks like a dolphin, <laughs> mm -hmm. or it might have distortions, artifacts, articles, things that seem off. Keep an eye open. I've actually even seen where the stego was just so weak that you were able to see the hidden data. Oh, no. Underneath, yeah, underneath the, uh, the actual image that it was embedded into. Oh, that's great. So don't think that these things couldn't be done with the human eye. They very well may be. But that's about all there is. I mean, it, it is what it is. It's a lot of stuff you don't need to know how to implement steganography. You just need to know, be aware about it, how it works, some of the tools that are encompassed with it, and why we are engaged in that activity. Awesome. Hidden Files, another wonderful episode. I enjoyed it thoroughly. It was a lot of fun. And by the way, you should pay attention to every single episode of CEHV10. Daniel's done a great job, very thorough, putting together this series for you so that you can pass your exam. And by the way, there's downloadable materials, there's notes, all kinds of things for you. And you're in the course library. There's thousands of hours of complimentary information in there designed to do one thing, help you be even more successful. So check that out as well. And tell everybody you know about IT Pro TV. <coughs> IT Pro TV is binge-worthy. Thanks for watching. I'm Zach Memis. And I'm Daniel Lowry. We will see you again very soon. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.
Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. Hello, and thank you for watching IT Pro TV, helping you learn everywhere you go. I'm your host, Zach Memes, for this episode of CEHB10. This episode is covering tracks because we have to do that. And Daniel Lowry, our expert, is going to show us how to do it, aren't you? Yeah, I'm going to do my level best, that's for sure, Zach. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for having me back on the show. And thank you for watching. We applaud your effort in the thanks. attaining of the CEH certification. Go forth, young child, and make good on the security good stuff. Uh, but in this today's episode, we are specifically going to be covering covering tracks. That's a difficult thing to say in, in, in a row. Uh, trying to keep ourselves from detection, as it were. So here's a, maybe a rhetorical question, but okay. we're, we're hired to do penetration testing. Correct. So then why do we need to cover our track? That's because, well, just because you're hired to do something doesn't mean that there aren't good reasons to cover your tracks. Right. Those reasons being very similar to what we talked about back in um, uh, hiding files, mm -hmm. right? For the same exact type of reasons. Maybe I'm doing true red team type of an engagement, and I need to stay under the radar for as long as humanly possible, mm. right? So I don't want to show that there's been any indication of compromise into the system, lest the blue team find me asunder, right? Then that would be bad. That'd be bad. Right? Well, it would be good for them because, hey, we were able to detect the red team in your face, red team. They get to, <laughs> they get to do that. But the game goes on and we continue. So we want to try to stay as stealthy as possible. Uh, other reasons could be, Again, to test the blue team's ability to detect the red team mm -hmm. and uh, what at what level. So maybe they just have a hint of hmm, something might be afoot here. Or, wow, somebody doing something inside of our system. We need to look a little closer. So that is a good reason for us to get in here, cover our tracks, along with hiding of certain types of files. So how would one go about covering one's tracks? Uh -huh. Well, if it's in the snow, you'll take a leafed branch. <laughs> so, no, uh, a couple of ways in which you could do this, uh, and you'll probably end up using all of them at some point in time, at least in your career, definitely, but maybe uh, even on a single engagement. Uh, let's see here. We can disable auditing mechanisms. That's a good way to start covering your tracks because if there's no tracks to cover, then your job is that much easier. That's your branch in the snow. That's, that's exactly, well, you don't even need the branch in the snow. No, yeah, I've now started it. hovering over the snow. Oh, yeah, that's right. And left zero tracks behind because the snow is for no, whatever reason, not. not. Yes, it's it's not making an indention. It's no impression. Yeah. So our auditing mechanisms are what, that's the proverbial snow. Right on, right on. Right? And our activities would be the footprints in them. If I turn off the snow, there is no snow to depress then there will be no tracks left behind. So there's a great way to start off. I've gained access. Let's just go ahead and turn auditing off completely so that I leave no tracks that I therefore must then cover. That's brilliant. Right? <laughs> Another way in which you can do it is to clear the logs. So, yes, I have left tracks. This would be my proverbial branch. This is your branch. Yeah. Yes, where I'm sweeping away the tracks. I'm going in, finding each track I have left, and I'm removing them. Now, I can do this in one of two ways. You could be just removing all the tracks wholesale. Right? I don't care what track it was or whether it was I that left it. I'm going to remove it. Goodbye. So long. So it might be in that way. Or you might selectively be grabbing your tracks, removing those. And a follow-up question to that might be, well, why do we, why wouldn't we just delete them all? Why wouldn't that be the way to go? Because we're trying to be stealthy. If I delete everything in the log file, most of the administrators are going to go, where's all the logs? And they might go, hey, Zach, did you delete all the logs or did you, like, remove them and copied them off site or something? And he's going to go, no. Have you? No. Somebody did because they're gone, right? So that might raise an eyebrow to someone going, thinking something has happened. It could be an indication of compromise. So for us to go in and selectively remove just what we as the as the threat actor has done, then that will keep that down to a bare minimum. Okay. The other last thing you can do is falsify logs. Maybe change some attributes of the logs that exist so that they don't look so damning, mm -hmm. as it were, right? Might not be such a uh, oh well, 
Zach was obviously logging in, or maybe I changed that, right? I say, well, it wasn't Zach that logged in, it was Billy or Sally. She did it, right? Or whatever. As long as I'm modifying and changing those logs some way, shape, or form so that it represents a false picture of what actually occurred, this can be really helpful when it comes to the legal end of things as far as like uh, an actual threat actor goes. They would want to do this, maybe not delete their tracks, but falsify their tracks so that if and when you do find out that they have compromised your system, well, you have records that are inadmissible to court because they've been falsified. You would have to, you would have to prove that it was them that, they, that did it, so it could be a good tactic by a bad actor. Well, can you demonstrate some of these techniques for us? Yeah, sure, totally. We, can, we can definitely do that. Let's jump into Kali here. And uh, one of the things that you have inside of most Linux systems it is keeping a history of the commands that you have done. That way, you, if you press up, you start seeing all these wonderful commands, right? That's, that's how you can do that, because it's reading that history file. You can also, there is a file here, ls-a, and it is bash underscore history. Do I have that? I notice I've got like a scapey history, right? There's one. But I'm not seeing my bash history here. That's okay. It's typically a file that's here, and uh, it's just hidden because it's got that dot in front of it. So when you do a, a normal ls, it doesn't show up. Okay, so you could go in, wipe that file out. Hey, great, now it's gone. They can't read the file if it doesn't exist. That'd be one good way to do it. Yeah. Another way is to, again, let's, let's start at the beginning. Let's turn auditing off because even though I've wiped out the file, doesn't mean it won't continue to auto, audit and create a new one with whatever it is you're doing inside of it. So let's turn auditing off. I'll do that by, uh, what is it? Um, Export, that's right, export, and you just say hist size equals zero, like so. And now, if I echo dollar sign hist size, you'll see it comes back with zero, and it is gonna keep zero records in the history now, mm. right? So we've effectively shut off that auditing. So anything I type in now will not be, and I've actually had to do this forensically before, not shut it off, but go and look at a history file to see what happened. There was a share, uh, there was a local law enforcement. They had uh, a mail server was compromised. They, uh, I came in to try to do some forensics investigation to find out where it came from. We did end up being able to track them back to, I think, Romania, if I'm remembering correctly, because they didn't clear out their tracks. They didn't cover it up at all. So I just looked right in the history file and go, here we go. Here's all the commands that they were running. And we saw they were doing FTP to a server in Romania. Going, oh, okay, well, here's some good tracks that'll lead you to the bad guy. And so always want to turn that off first so that it doesn't continue to create logs of what it is you're doing, okay? Let's see here. Let's move over to uh, a Windows system. Let's get open the old uh, command prompt here. And what we can do here is we can use audit Paul, audit Paul, P-O-L. Get zoomed in so you can see that pretty well. There you go. And what that'll do is it'll uh, change the audit policy of the machine. And if you hit return, it gives you some options. And you can start playing around with this. Anything you're not sure about, you can always use the forward slash question mark to help elucidate what it is they mean by this stuff. But typically what you want to do is something to the effect of audit Paul... And you can give it the username if it's a remote system. If not, it'll assume that it's the local machine, right? So you can do whack, whack, you know, um, SRV 2012, I think is the name of this machine. Uh, and that should work. And you can just say forward slash audits, or what am I doing here? Um, uh, it has audit objects. What can you uh, actually audit? And then what do you want to do? You want to enable or disable? So I would pick my audit object like system forward slash system. Uh, and then I would do colon like all. So all the system auditing that it's doing, I could do enable. Or what we want to do, disable. Like so. Mm -hmm. Right? And of course, Audi Paul is not a valid thing. So <laughs> let me add the T to that and see if it'll fire off. Not the right spot, Daniel. There we go. I've got an incorrect in parameter, but it's 
you just have to go through and um I'm I'm sure I've just got like a a weird thing. Maybe this is is wrong or something, but there you go. You get the ID. You can look through the help system. Use Audit Paul to actually disable that. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, you don't have to actually know how to do this for the exam, I'm pretty sure. They might get you on a little bit of this, but there we go. All right, so now that we've seen how to turn it off, let's see how we can clear some auditing, right? So my favorite way to do this stuff is just go in here and go into Event Viewer. There we go. Once it brings up the Event Viewer, I will be able to go to the Windows Logs and look at something like security where it's doing logging of things that might lead someone to believe that something bad is happening. Mm -hmm. And I'll just choose this first one here. And you'll notice right over here, I've got clear log. You can save the log contents before clearing it. Eh, let's just clear it out. And there you go. They're all cleared out. You can also do them one at a time. I think if you just like right click on it, and is it deletes and properties? There is a way to do just the specific events, but I, uh, oh, maybe it's down here somewhere. Event properties attached to this event. It's funny, pretty sure there is normally a, hey, delete this one thing, but it's not showing any. Save all events, attach this to a log, view, refresh, help, event properties. Weird. Could have swore there was a specific way. Anyway, you can come in here, clear out the logs that you, uh, all of them, uh, apparently. Attach this to event, copy. I am surprised that that does not exist. View, no, it's not there. Wow, that one's got my brain scratched. I'm going to have to look that up later because I'm, okay. I'm almost positive there's a way to do it. But the event viewer does give you those um, those ways in which you can obviously at least clear the entire event log out for specific events. So if you're going to go that wholesale route, maybe that's the way you want to rock, right? Get rid of the snow. Let's see. Other things you can use is uh, Metasploit has clear rev. So if you've got a Metasploit hook into something, you can use the clear rev command to clear out all the the system locks. Uh, what else can you use? The Windows command shell, I think web util. I don't know if I have that. I don't know if it's, I don't remember if it's a um, built in or if it's a third party. Let me close this. Let's see if I can do it from here. Web util, uh, CL application, not supplication. Application. Yeah, it must be a third party. So web util, get that installed, and you'll be able to clear logs based off of their uh, specifics uh, using that as well. Let's see, anything else? Yeah, well, we've been bouncing around here inside of Windows a little bit. Let's jump back into some Linux. Let's look at their log files. We've seen how to disable logging, but, mm. well, at least in some way, shape, or form. If we go to cd slash var slash log, here's where the logs for almost everything exists. So you want to spend some time in here. One of them that is definitely worth your time and effort is that auth.log right there. That's any kind of authorization that you have done. So if you tried to elevate privileges, you've done something administrative, it's going to keep uh, accounts on that. So if we cat auth.log, you'll see here's where a session for root was created. Just kind of scroll through here, nothing Crazy, just open, closed, open, closed, open, closed. But it is a, um, a trail of what you've done. And right? so you want to look through there, find anything that you know that you've been doing, and remove those out of there. Mm-hmm. And again, you could do wholesale. One of the ways you can do this is just echo nothing into audit dot, or right, is it audits? Auth dot log. Now it's, that would wipe it out. It'll be ixnay, be nothing there after that. Uh, you can also, um, I think you can like echo slash dev slash null dev null into not x zero echo into your file. So auth.log. That will kind of give you the same idea. 
which will, because there's nothing in devnull. It's, it's an empty file, okay? Uh, pretty simple there, or you could cat it. I think you'd have to cat it, not echo it. Cat, like so. That should do it as well. Um, you can use sed to clear out specific logs. So let's say we wanted to remove everything that said opened, right, for use by root. I could use sed, come back down here. Uh, do, 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 do. Control E, get the in there. There we go. And I'll do sed I, which does an inline replacement for whatever line it finds with whatever you tell it to do. And here I'm going to do a slash what opened with D for delete and then slash var slash log auth dot log. There we go. Now when we cat auth dot log, you notice it only says closed now. There are no opened files because we use said to go in there and cut all those lines out, delete them, and we've modified the file that way. Right? So said really good way for clearing out specific log files wholesale when working inside of a Linux system. Uh, of course, you could go in and just, you know, something like nano auth dot log, and I could actually copy, paste, cut, and start manipulating, doing that falsification of a log right here, pretty simply, just using my favorite text editor and the log file of my choice, and nothing but a good imagination to make it worthwhile, right? So uh, very, very fun. Now, let's see here. Oh, I don't want you, I want you to control X. There we go. Clear this. A couple other things, we'll be out of time. There's not a lot to this. It's pretty mm -hmm. straightforward, right? Um, let's erase our shell history. Now we've turned off logging, but it doesn't mean that um, uh, like I'm pushing up and nothing is happening, but our shell history still might be there under that. So I can erase it by doing history-c to clear it out. That'll work. Mm -hmm. I can also do um, the current shell history. So doing dash C does the entirety of the system. If I want the shell that I'm in to be cleared out, just do the same thing, but with a dash W like so. Okay, pretty straightforward. Cool. Let's see, what else do we have? I've shown you the echo command. That's fun. You can do that in any, like where you echo nothing into a file. Do that with any file that you wish to wipe out completely, right? So the, under, the bash underscore history, that file was there. You could wipe it out that way. Um, pretty pretty easy. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? Let's go back to Windows. I think it has some of these options as well. Let's go into the, um, I think in here, if you do Alt F7. So if I press up, if I, let's see here, CLS and uh, CD. And DIR. So now if I'm pressing up, you'll notice that it's giving me those options because it's saving that history. Hopefully this works. Let's see here. If I press Alt F7, and my keyboard's a little, little weird, so Alt F7, I think that wipes that out. And it does. I'm pushing up and down and nothing's happening. So great. Alt F7 wipes out your command line history if you're in Windows system. You're in PowerShell, you use, let's go there. Whoop up old PowerShell, where are you? There you are. And we'll start doing the same kind of thing. DIR, CD dot dot slash dot dot, uh, DIR, CLS. Um, there we go, we've done a lot of stuff. If I'm, get back up here where you guys can see. Pressing up, right, and you start to see it scrolling through my, my history. I think here, all we have to do is type clear dash history. There we go. And now it doesn't work, but it probably does on our, like a restart the shell. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not, not a huge PowerShell fan, except for the part that allows me to do Linux stuff. Right. But um, hey, what are you gonna do? Uh, let's get that out of here. Anything else destroying files? Oh, there's the shred command inside of Linux, bouncing back over there. So if I've got a file, let's go to slash temp just so we can play around. I will touch uh, destroy me.txt, right? And echo get rid of this file ASAP. Like that into, into, what was it, destroy me? Yeah. So now if I cat 
destroy me.txt, get rid of this file ASAP, but not just delete it. We're gonna overwrite it with a bunch of zeros, and then we're gonna delete it. And you can do, do the use the shred command to do that very thing. So shred dash uh, zu, like so, for destroy me dot text, and now ls, you'll notice I'm not getting anything here. Just do an ls, and destroy me is gone. And not only that, but it overwrote that file. So if it were to be used with uh, some type of recovery tool, that it would have been an overwritten file, completely messing up any kind of data that would have been on it. That's brilliant. Yeah, great stuff. I love the shred util. Can we change timestamps? Yeah, you can use the timestamp utility. That's a really mm -hmm. good point to bring up because files still have attributes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they call it MACE, which is modified access created and entry modified, right? So that's the MACE command, right? Or mm -hmm. not command, but acronym. Uh, and what you can do is you can, if you're in Metasploit, you got hooks into something, uh, maybe a interpreter shell thing going on, you can throw commands that you can use timestamp to modify, kind of going back to that falsification idea to modifying the date and time. So you can say, oh, well, this file wasn't even uh, during the time of the, of the exploit or whatever. So again, maybe making it in uh, admissible to a court system because it doesn't fall within the designated time areas mm. of when they've determined that the breach had occurred. So uh, good, good to be able to show your client that you could have done that by creating a file, doing the timestamp, or backing up a legitimate file, timestamping it with uh, Metasploit, changing it, and then showing them that you have done that, and then restoring the original file, letting them know, hey, this is something you really have to worry about if someone gets this level of access. But when it comes to Again, covering your tracks, make sure that you're, you're gonna run into the scenarios where clearing everything out is the right thing to do, mm -hmm. clearing some things out is the right thing to do, maybe doing some falsifications is the right thing to do, or maybe doing all three of those, or a combination thereof is the right thing to do. So just be aware of how you can work with those things. Turn off that logging so you don't leave tracks, and that'll get you to the mountaintop when it comes to clearing your tracks. Fantastic. And covering your tracks, of course, called out up for the exam. As far as everything else that we've been covering, too, and every single episode of CEHV10, you want to make sure you pay attention. Watch, rewatch, take notes. Speaking of notes, downloadable materials, downloadable notes, everything there for you to help you pass that exam. And by the way, you'll be in the course library. There's thousands of hours of complimentary information in there designed to do one thing, help you be even more successful. So check that out as well. And tell everybody you know about IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV is binge worthy. Thanks for watching. I'm Zach Memis. And I'm Daniel Lowry. We will see you again soon. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.